Okay, lecture 36 in statics. We are definitely nearing the end of our journey through rigid body mechanics part one, statics. Um, so a couple of uh, quick announcements. So the attendance grades are up to date. One of the things I'll mention about the homework, so uh, I had a student who um, uh, asked a question about homework 6.1. Uh, I think there was a, a mistake that one of the TAs made where they meant to, the, the student was supposed to get 9 out of 10, so minus 1, and instead they gave them a 1 out of 10. It was a, just a genuine mistake, and so I corrected that. But I'm going to go through homework 6.1 to see if there's any other, uh, or, or other students in that similar boat. Uh, so if there are, I will correct that. My apologies there. Um, and I'll, uh, there's a couple of other assignments I'm going to check just to make sure. If, and, and my... General philosophy is I'm either going to leave the grade where it is or raise it. I won't look back and go, well, you should have, you got an 80, but you should have got a 60. I'm, I'm not going to do that. So don't worry about that. Um, <clears throat> homework 7, which is your final assignment, is due Wednesday when we come back. Um, and it is not on this exam. Uh, and all of the solutions of the homework assignments related to this exam are posted. So you've got everything that you need in terms of the uh, the exam. Today's focus is the exam review. Um, I have said before that I believe that this exam is among the easiest of the four exams that we take in this class. I still hold that uh, I belief for uh, uh, today. Um, I'll go through the topics and the, the logistics and whatnot, and we'll leave it open for any questions that you have. Um, so first off, hopefully by now the logistics you can kind of predict. It's not going to be any different than it has before. Um, the exam is going to open. I'm going to turn it on on Blackboard at 12.58, so a couple of minutes prior to uh, the, uh, the 1 o'clock window, just to, in case there's any technical glitches or anything like that, and it will close at 1.55. It's designed to be 50 minutes long, but you've got a little bit of extra time in there. And again, I use the same rule as I've always used. Um, if it takes, and, and again, so what I'll do is I'll time myself doing the exam and it better take me 50 minutes divided by three to do the exam, uh, which it has for the last two. Um, in terms of the format of how the exam is delivered on Blackboard, so it's a forced completion exam. So once you start it, you have to complete it in one sitting. Uh, it is timed uh, with an auto submit feature and the questions will appear all at once. Um, I would suggest to everybody in here that you charge your laptops. We had a couple incidents on the last assignment where the laptop died. Um, so you make sure you have your laptops charged. If you need, okay, there's outlets right here, and there's outlets right here on this side. So if it's that bad and you need, bring your adapter and whatnot. But do me a favor and make sure your laptops are charged and whatnot for the exam. It's open book, open notes. Uh, that means you can use any resource on Blackboard, the lecture notes, the recordings, the homework solutions. I, I don't care. Use anything that's on Blackboard. Again, as I said before, the one resource that you're not use, allowed to use is another individual. So check any, you know, anybody else in the class, you know, anything like that. Um, it's the same format as it has been in previous exams, four to five conceptual questions, two to three computational problems. Do me a favor, and again, please type out an answer for every question. It helps with the computational problems uh, as well. Um, don't just answer the question on your scratch work. There were a couple of students on the last exam. There was literally nothing on their scratch work, and then they typed out an answer on Blackboard, and it was wrong. It's like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. So please put something down on the paper. It really does help out. One of the things that I was, uh, there were some other students working on some other assignments in one of the collaboration rooms, and I don't know if you, I thought I had, had made it clear, but there was a couple students who, uh, who didn't know that after the last two exams, I posted videos on teams that went through the statistics and suggestions for future exams. I would look at that because there are some suggestions which I believe, if followed, would definitely raise the class average by a few points. So I, I really would look at those. Um, but let's talk about the topics on the exam. So. This exam covers really two areas, centroids and structural analysis. So for centroids, be able to locate the centroid of a line, an area, uh, a volume, and be able to compute the moment of inertia. That, that's basically it. Uh, and for structural analysis, there's really two areas that we did with structural analysis, and that's trusses and shear and moment diagrams. But 
For both of those, you needed to be able to compute support reactions because you needed those to be able to either begin the method of joints or method of sections, or you needed those to be able to begin to construct shear diagrams and then as a result, moment diagrams. So be able to compute support reactions and be able to compute the internal forces and members of plane trusses using the method of joints or the method of sections and be able to draw the shear and moment diagram for beams. Um, one of the things I'll say right off the bat, I will answer two questions that might be uh, swimming in the back of your head. Uh, first off, um, so here I have the, uh, the, the sort of formal definitions of the moments of area. Am I going to give you some parabolic ellipsoid and say to derive the, the centroid as a function of X or B or A? No, I'm not going to do that, okay? The whole purpose behind homework 5.1 was so that when you use that library of, of, of uh, centroids for circles and triangles and so on and so forth, that you had an appreciation of where those uh, H over 3s and 4R over 3 pi's came from. But I'm not going to make you do that on the exam. So relax, don't worry, none of that. Okay. So, so that would be the first uh, question I, I would go ahead and preemptively answer. The second is on this um, truss analysis uh, uh, topic, we covered two methods for uh, truss analysis, the method of joints and the method of sections. I will most likely not tell you which method that you need to use to assess a given problem. That being said, there are probably methods that are more advantageous than others uh, for a given problem. For example, if I give you a ginormous truss and I want a force in one member right in the middle, it is probably more advantageous to utilize the method of sections because I don't need to solve 800 joints to get to the, the member in the middle, okay? So that, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you what, what method to use, but there's probably some strategy in using one method versus another. Um, okay, so uh, sort of the, uh, the formulas that I provide, which by the way, this is lecture slide 36. If you go to Blackboard, you'll see there's a section in the lecture notes called exam three review, and I, and I kind of put these lecture slides together so that 90%, 95% of all the stuff that you need is all in this set of slides. So here's the definition for the moments of area. Um, remember, we utilize the first moment of area because we take the first moment of area and divide it by the area. We determine the location of the centroid. And the second moment of area is also the moment of inertia. Um, here, are, uh, here is a, a set of centroid references for two-dimensional regions. I will go ahead and tell you straight, we're not going to use anything beyond what's in this table. Okay, So I'm not going to use some off-the-wall, parabolic, ellipsoid, crazy shape and say, find the centroid. If it's not in this table, you don't need to worry about it. Okay, So just right off the bat, I'm not going to ask you anything super crazy on that. Um, 3D centroid references, nothing outside this either. Okay, So here's a hemisphere, uh, uh, ellipsoid. Again, I, I think it'd probably be pretty rare I even ask you one of these. Um, moment of inertia of a composite shape, I do expect you to understand that algorithm. Uh, where you compute the centroid, and then you're basically summing up your I plus AD squared, where the Ds are the difference between the centroid of an individual shape and the centroid of the whole thing. Remember, the order of the subtraction doesn't really matter because you're going to take this D term and square it. So it doesn't matter if you do Y minus Y bar or Y bar minus Y. It's not going to matter. References for the moment of inertia. Again, I will not ask you anything beyond this. So don't, don't think I'm going to ask you anything uh, uh, super crazy with these shapes uh, either. I'm getting a phone call on my office line. I will hang up on that because I'm teaching. It's one of the downsides. Of, that's one of the downsides of Teams. I don't know what happened there, but uh, our office lines at Marshall are tied into Teams. So, so yeah. Um, for the for trust analysis, we have the method of joints or the method of sections. What the? Ever since now, now my remote isn't working. Hold on. There we, there we go. Okay, the method of joints or the method of sections. Remember when you're utilizing the method of joints for each joint, you have at your disposal only two equations of equilibrium because all the forces all meet at a common point. So whenever you're utilizing the method of joint, you have to start at a joint with no more than two unknowns and you can only, as you're going through the truss, you can only solve a joint with at most two unknowns. Um, but with the method of sections, you can solve uh, a section with three unknowns because the method of sections uh, deals with non-concurrent force systems. And then you have that 
third equation of equilibrium at your disposal because the forces don't all meet at a common point, unlike the case with the, uh, the method of sections. Um, likewise with the method of joints and with the method of sections, it doesn't really matter what order you take or what method you use, but there are some methods that are more advantageous than others. One of the things that I think has been sort of a theme with the last couple of exams is time management. Um, there are um, easy ways of doing problems and hard ways of doing problems. I would probably just take a step back for a given problem and think, okay, what is the easiest way of going about doing this problem and try and attack it that way. Um, again, I, I, I generally don't design my exams to be time crunchers. Um, the derived relationship between load shear and moment, so ultimately we are integrating the load diagram and that is the shear diagram and then by integrating the shear diagram that results in the moment diagram. Um, here are the conclusions basically, here's our mathematical relationship and the conclusions uh, from that mathematical relationship that we use for plotting shear and moment diagrams and then that results into how we address shear and moment diagrams for concentrated effects where our shear diagram is a series of constant functions for concentrated loads and, a ser and the moment diagram is a series of linear functions. And then for distributed loads, the distributed load is constant so the shear diagram is linear which means the uh, moment diagram is quadratic, it's a parabola. Um, that is pretty much everything that is on the second exam, or sorry, the third exam. Uh, I'm going to shut up now and open the floor to you and see if there's any questions that you have about anything we, we've discussed since exam two. So, floor is yours. Everybody's quiet. What's that? I could probably post some on Teams. I can I can collate a few together. I don't have a problem with that. That it? I I can do that. That's easy. Yes. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Okay. That's a, fair, that's a very fair question. The easiest way to explain that would be to look at this. So the question was about the internal response, right? So um, let, me, let me go through this example and I think you'll, you'll, your answer, your question will probably be answered. So this was the first shear and moment diagram uh, problem that we, um, that we utilized. Uh, so we had a beam with a series of concentrated forces and we determined our support reactions and then we plotted our shear and moment diagrams accordingly. Now let's just take a look at shear for example. Okay, The easiest way to, to answer your question is, is so the sign convention that we utilize internally where the left side is down and the right side is up allows us to draw the shear diagram graphically, you know, or in other words, just taking a look at the beam and going up 35.8 and then down 20, et cetera. And if you don't believe that, the best way of ver uh, verifying that is to go back to one of the initial questions that this problem asks. So the problem asks, after we finish this example, can we use the shear diagrams uh, to determine the internal shears and moments at a point 12 feet to the right of A? And does this answer match what we compute by cutting a section? Well, if we look at a point 12 feet to the right of A, which is where this section is right here, and I'll just look at the shear diagram to kind of uh, uh, illustrate this. So at a point 12 feet to the right of A, the shear is 15.8 kips. Well, what happens when we uh, cut a section? Well, when we cut a section, this is what we have. And probably what, what we're, we're talking about is this right here, where if we have the beam and we cut a section and we look to the left, when we look to the left, our sign convention says that downward shears are positive. So I'm drawing the shear according to its positive sign convention and then going through and chugging through. I've got 35.8 going up, 20 going down, so I need another 15.8 going down to reach equilibrium, and that 15.8 matches what we got up here. So I guess the shortest answer to the question after going through all of that is that shear that sign convention has been selected such that it matches the graphical technique that we use here. Does that make sense?
And so I get where you're saying where it like it looks backwards. Shouldn't the left side be up and the right side be down? But we're talking about the internal response. So it's sort of like, I guess maybe the closest analogy is if like if you're doing a joint analysis, one force goes this way, the other goes that way. So it's just selected so that it matches this, this graphical approach. Does, does that answer your question? And how about everybody else? Did that make sense? So yeah, so the... The best, way, uh, the best way of testing this is see how I cut a section and look to the left. If we were to take this same problem and cut a section and look to the right, we would be drawing our shear upward and our moment clockwise, but we would get the same answer. We would get a V of positive 15.8 kips and a moment of positive 309.6 kips. It doesn't matter which way we look when we cut a section. It's just some directions are more advantageous than others. There's just less stuff on the left than there is on the right. Excuse me. Does that sound good? All right. This is your time. We've got plenty of time to discuss stuff with trusses, with centroids, shear and moment. You name it. Floor is yours. No, we can't skip the exam. We got to have it. So, yeah. <laughs> did you like this I I did not. <laughs> I did not. I did check the Marshall University undergraduate catalog and the uh, academic policies related to excused absences, and I did not find attendance of TikTok celebrity rallies to account as uh, as as an excuse for, or for an excuse. As I, as I said, as I said to, to some other students earlier, and I want to be 100% crystal clear, that's not going to be on the third exam. So. <laughs> The thing is, though, if, if, you know, if you were thinking about, like, skipping class and, like, the professor won't know, putting yourself on TikTok, you know, geolocated you know, geo and timestamp probably wasn't the best way. But then again, a lot of you just told me, yeah, I'm, I'm not coming to class. Okay, well. <laughs> I mean, I was going to lose sleep, and then... Yeah, about that. <laughs> well, what, hap what happened was I, I had mentioned before class, I said, you know, I've been, on, I I've, I've been at Marshall for quite some time, and I know when something's going on on campus, when to just go straight and when to do this. And I was leaving um, uh, Starbucks, and I, of course, did this. And there were a lot of students here saying, hey, come here, come here. And I just and, – and, and here's what I did. I looked right by you, and I just said, bye, and walked away. You look like you were really fascinated by what was going on until you saw us standing there. Yeah. <laughs> and you were like, oh, that's what I'm doing. Those are suppositional conclusions I won't give any credence to, so. <laughs> I get it, and I'm good. <laughs> I generally get the theme, and I'm good, so. Again, I, I've, I've been here for <laughs> quite some time. That isn't uh, the, the first rodeo I've seen going on. Okay, come on, let's get back to statics. Any other questions about, you know, centroids and trusses and, and um, shear and moment diagrams? Yes? Uh, could you just, like, outline the main steps of the moment of inertia? Okay, that's a great question. Okay, so uh, the, the steps for the moment of inertia. So... I'm going to use um, the example that we did in class to sort of guide that. So I think that the first thing that you ought to do whenever you're given a, a, a given region and you need to compute the moment of inertia, which, by the way, I, I think before we get into this, I do think moment of inertia problems give you sort of a good bang for your buck uh, 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 value in terms of studying. Because if you understand this, 
you definitely understand how to compute a centroid because this, you know, computing a centroid is only half of the problem, right? Um, but going back to, to your um, to your step by step process, so the first thing that I think you need to do is take the region and split it up into a series of simple shapes, right? So I've got a rectangle, a triangle, um, a semicircle, and then you know this uh, circular hole here. One of the other things I think that's worth mentioning is that this is not the right way to split it up, okay? What I mean by that is I could very easily have done this. I could have said, okay, here is a solid shape with a triangular hole like that. I could have done that. Do you see what I'm saying? And a circular hole right here. So in other words, I chose to treat like this as a rectangle and this as a triangle that were both solid. I could have treated this as one solid rectangle and this as a triangular hole. Like there, That would have been fine too. The math would have come out the same at the end of the day. So that's the first thing I would point out. Now, this, once you split this up into simple shapes, I think what you should do for each one of these shapes is to try and compute three values. You should compute the area of those shapes. You should compute the moment of inertia of those shapes, and specifically the moment of inertia about the axis in question. So for instance, this problem was all about computing the moment of inertia with respect to horizontal axes. So if you notice, I'm computing the moment of inertia with respect to the x-axis. I'm using this formula here, not this one. Okay, So make sure that you're referencing your formulas appropriately. And finally, I think you need the y distance, the distance from your chosen datum, your chosen reference axis to the centroid of each individual shape. And so. So you can see here's that data for the rectangle, here's that data for the triangle, here's that data for the circular hole, here's that data for the semicircle. So that, that's like the very sort of first two steps I would do. Split it up into simple shapes and get A, Y, and I for each of those shapes. Once you get that, it, it does kind of become pretty plug and chug at that point because you list your uh, shapes, we have the area, the Y, and the I's. Okay, so the next thing that you have to do is compute the centroid. So A times Y, A times Y, A times Y, A times Y, right here. Sum, sum, divide those two, and that gives you the centroid. So now we have the centroid located. We've got I, we've got A. D is just this Minus, sorry, this minus this, this minus this, this minus this, this minus this. I plus AD squared sum, you're done. I think the hard work is sort of at the beginning, breaking up your shape and collecting the data. Once you got the data, it kind of becomes a little boring, because like, you're just chugging it out. And again, going back to what I said earlier, the, the fact that you get a lot of value studying these problems because of centroid locations, take area and y, like these two values, you have to look up those values for each of the simple shapes because once you get these, sum of a, y over sum of a, that's the location of the centroid. So if you understand how to compute a moment of inertia, you are by default already understanding how to compute the location of a centroid. Now, going back to you, did that answer the questions as a whole, or was there anything else about this that was a little fuzzy? Yeah, yeah. Or right, how about everybody else? Everybody good on that? Yes, sir. That's a great question. That's a great question. So the short answer is I go off of the diagram. So whenever you're utilizing the parallel axis theorem, you need to make sure that your distances and your axes are all referenced from the same location. So what I mean by that is whenever I say where the centroid is, that's the centroid, so how far over it is from each side. For the moments of inertia, if you look here, let's take a look at the rectangle. 
So if you take a look at the rectangle, what you'll see are two sets of axes. You see x and y, and you see x prime and y prime. The x prime and y prime axes are located at the centroid. Okay. So for example, if you look over here, you see ix and iy, and then you see ix prime, iy prime. The ix and the iy are computing the moment of inertia with respect to this point, whereas the ix prime and the iy prime are computing the moment of inertia with respect to this point. When you're utilizing the parallel axis theorem, more often than not, and especially with you know, the types of problems we're doing in here, you want to have your individual moments of inertia referenced with respect to the centroid, which is why we use ix prime, 1 over 12 bh cubed. We didn't use ix because ix was referenced with respect to the corner. Each of these given distances, e each of these given uh, moments of inertia need to be uh, referenced with respect to the centroid. And the reason why is because of the d distances that we're using. The algorithm that was presented suggested that d was the distance from the, it was y for the centroid of each individual shape minus y for the whole thing. So that individual y distance was going to the centroid, right? So if it's going to the centroid, then the moments of inertia need to be referenced with respect to that same centroid. Does that make sense? That, that's why we're using those values and not these. So likewise for the triangle, notice how the triangle, I'm using 1 over 36 bh cubed because that was with respect to the centroidal axis of that triangle. Does that make sense? Everybody else okay with that? This is good stuff. I like it. We haven't had many trust questions. Are there any trust questions from the room? Okay, so I think that the um, <clears throat> the best thing that's worth mentioning with the method of joints. So, so first off, let's let's take a look at this problem here with the the method of joints. Um, is everybody okay with the computation of the support reactions? Because I, I don't want there to be any confusion with how we computed CX or CY or EY on top of trying to figure out how the heck to solve a truss. Is everybody okay with that? Okay, so the, the, the best thing to do when you're looking at a method of joints problem is to plan it out before you do any math, okay? So let me, let me copy this image. Hold on, let me grab the actual truss image. Let's copy this image. Actually, let, we'll, we'll, we'll copy these. Okay. Okay, so here's the truss that we were doing in this example. And everybody's okay, hopefully, with the support reactions. Notice that the horizontal support reaction on that one was zero. Okay? So I think that what you ought to do before you do any math is plan your problem from start to finish. Okay? So let's say that our goal is to solve the entire truss. Okay? So um, I want you to tell me could we, or I want you to answer this question. Could we start our problem at joint E? The letter E. Could we start there? Now you're shaking your head no. Why? Exactly right. You can start your analysis with a joint, <clears throat> sorry, that has at most two unknowns. You cannot start your analysis at joint E because there are three members going through joint E. That doesn't mean we can't solve joint E, that just means we can't solve it right now, okay? So the equations of static equilibrium will not allow us right now to solve for the equilibrium at joint E, nor will it allow us to solve for the equilibrium at joint D, or where else? B. But 
we could solve for joint A and then move on from there. We could solve for joint A and then we could solve for joint C or however. So the first thing I think you ought to do is plan your attack. So where would you like to start? I'm asking you. A. Okay. So let's, let's game this out. So joint A. What will joint A give us when we're finished? Joint A will give us the force in AB and the force in AD. I'm not, we don't have to do the math right now. I'm just saying that's what we're going to get from that joint at the end of the day. Does that make sense? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight that and say, okay, after we're finished with that joint, that's going to give us that answer. Now, what I want you to, now what I want you to do is I want you to help me out. Okay. Can we solve joint B? No. Our second joint cannot be joint B because there are too many unknowns going through joint B. We still have three, right? Can we solve joint E? No. Can we solve joint D? Yes. Because after joint A, we will know this unknown. So we could solve joint D. Now, is that the only way of doing this problem? No. Because what's another joint that we can solve after joint A? C, right? You see where I'm going with this? So what I'm saying is sort of playing out what's going to happen as a result of the analysis. What is joint D going to give you? Joint D is going to give you these two members, right? So it's going to give you this and this. Now, theoretically, we should be able to solve for any one of those remaining joints, right? Because we have two unknowns, two unknowns, two unknowns remaining. I propose, and this is Dr. Mike's tips and tricks for you, I would avoid your next joint being joint E. Okay, There is a reason why. First off, nothing about static equilibrium says that I can't solve for joint E. Okay, But I'm just going to give you a Dr. Mike's tips and tricks for, for this. If I solve for joint C, I'm going to have one horizontal component from uh, that horizontal member and a horizontal and vertical from this diagonal. Same thing over here. But with this... If I solve for this joint right now, see how I have two diagonals? Those two diagonals mean I have two horizontal components, two vertical components. You know what that means? Two equations, two unknowns. Got to break out the Casio FX115ES plus and break out that equation solver to solve that joint. A much easier way is to just not deal with joint E right now. Okay. Try and avoid that. Try and avoid situations where you've got two unknowns and they're both diagonals. Just try and avoid it. Okay. So I propose that we go ahead and do, I don't know, joint C. And joint C is going to give that and that. And so now we only have one left, which do you think would be easier now, dealing with joint B or joint E? See, see, I think, here's why I think E would be easier. How many members are going through joint B? Four. How many members are going through joint E? Three. I think it's easier to deal with joint E because there's only one. Uh, uh, there's a, there's one less member I got to deal with. So if you want if if you want an answer as to like the strategy, I, I think you should map out how you're going to attack the problem. What is each of these joint? Uh, uh, what are each of these joint analyses going to produce? Before you start just 
drawing arrows and, and angles and doing tricks. Like, wait a minute, what's the goal? What am I getting out of this? I think you'll find at the end of the day that the joint analyses become infinitely easier because you're not just running down a maze with no clear end in sight. Okay? Does that make sense? Everybody else okay with that? Now, do we need to go through one of these? You want to go through one of these joint analyses or, I mean, or not? I don't need to if you don't want to. I'm asking. Everybody's quiet. I'm going to take that as a no. What? Okay. I'm going to take that as an I'm fine. Look, we got plenty of time, and I don't want to. I don't want to spend time on stuff if we've got other questions to ask. Did that answer your question? Okay. I, I desperately think that that would be valuable in your approach. And the other thing about this approach is that I think it will um, give you some clarity on whether or not the. Let's say I give you a really, really big truss. And then the question is, do I do the method of joints or do I do the method of sections? Well, now you've got some ammunition to maybe try and figure that out. You might say, okay, if I do method of joints, i got to do 12 joints to get there. But if I do the method of sections, I can do it in one answer. Well, that mean, maybe the method of sections makes more sense. But then maybe I give you another trust, and you can solve the members in question by only doing one or two joints. It's like, well, why don't you just use the method of joints? It's a lot easier. You see what I mean? So use a little bit of strategic thinking in terms of assessing how you're going to go about attacking a problem. Because, again, I'm not a micromanager. You know, if I give you a trust, I might not say, you know, solve it using this method. I might just say solve it, and you all figure out what's the best way of doing it. Makes it harder for me to grade, I'll admit, but in the end, I'm trying to teach you all something. So, And I get paid to do this. So. <clears throat> Any other questions? We got plenty of time. Everybody ready for this week to be over, I guess? Everybody ready for this semester to be over? And you don't have to be that excited for the class to be over. I mean, I see how it is. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. If there are no further questions, I don't mind in the, ending the exam uh, review early. I just don't want to end if there's anything that you don't feel comfortable with. Is there anybody that's not comfortable about a particular topic on the exam, or do you feel fine? I mean, tell me. I mean, how are you feeling? Everybody good? Going once, twice. We'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>